Hi, welcome to the next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And I'm Brittany. And this week, Brittany, we're going to finish up our talk about elbow and hip dysplasia. Mm -hmm. And we're going to concentrate on the treatment uh, of elbow dysplasia and also how to prevent it okay. uh, and get rid of this uh, disease because it's a primarily genetic disease, as we talked to before. So when we're dealing with the elbow, most of our treatments... Um, that beyond uh, medications and supplements are going to be surgical. Okay. And each one of those conditions we talked about before has its own surgical approach and surgical treatment. So the one, uh, the medial coronary process, the neck is fragmented. Uh, we're going to go in and take that little piece of bone out. Oh. And they can actually do better without that piece of bone. They're not going to have a normal joint. It can be done through arthroscopy, which is oftentimes preferred method, but they can also do an arthrotomy where we open up the joint and take that out. Okay. Um, so if you're doing arthroscopy, it's gonna have to go to an orthopedic specialist and they can actually smooth out the bone and, and do all sorts of neat things in there to clean up the joint once they're done. Cool. Same thing's gonna happen with the uh, OCD lesions. When we get that cartilage flap, we gotta take that out. And it's important that they go in and clean off the end of the bone there. Uh, underneath that cartilage as well. Mm -hmm. um, I did read they are doing some experiments with cartilage grafts to try and replace that piece of cartilage huh. that gets removed. I don't know how effective they are. They didn't have any studies showing that they're doing anything effective for the dogs, but it's an option that may become more of a, a option in the future. Yeah. For the ununited ankyneal process, and that's that little hook on the tip of the ulna that holds into the radius notch there. Depends on when we diagnose it. They've shown that if you can catch these dogs between four and six months of age, you can do what's called an ulnar osteectomy. And this is where we'll go into the ulna and actually remove a piece of the bone. Remove? Right. Oh. So we're going to go a little bit down from the elbow towards the wrist, but not quite all the way. They'll remove a section of the bone. And because the problem's caused because the ulna's not growing as fast as the radius, now we've got space for that ulna to stretch out oh. and it takes the pressure off that ankyneal process. Wow. If we catch it early enough, the ankyneal process will actually reattach to the ulna and heal. Wow. They've actually, uh, in a little bit older dogs, any closer to six months of age that may not heal in, they've actually tried to use a screw to screw that back onto there along okay. with that osteectomy. So it really is kind of a judgment call on the surgeon's part whether they're going to do that. It's a very tricky screw placement. It has to be placed perfectly because it's a little tiny piece of bone you're putting the screw in. And it's called a lag screw because basically the threads are going to engage in that little tip of the bone and it's going to just go through the back of the ulna uh, to grab that and hold it in place. Hmm. In older dogs, oftentimes what we have to do when is just go in and remove the ink and nail process, yeah. like we do with the fragmented medial coronoid process. And that's going to, again, give the dogs an abnormal joint, but it's going to take that floating piece of bone out there that's causing a lot of pain and get that out of the joint. And it gives them, again, a chance to look in the joint and deal with any other problems. And then if we've got these radial incongruities where the radius bone in the, in the lower part of the leg is growing um, too fast, again, that ulnar osteectomy can be very effective in helping correct that growth deformity. Okay. So really it's going to depend on which part of the elbow is being affected and how old the dog is, what the treatment's going to be if they're going to do a surgical treatment. Okay. They are actually working on developing total elbow replacements. Oh. So just like we have total hip replacements we'll talk about in a little bit, they can actually put in an artificial elbow joint, which kind of makes sense because they bear a lot of weight on those joints. Yeah. Um, some of them are basically replace just the medial or the inside part of the elbow because that seems to be the part that's affected. Some of them replace the whole elbow. Hmm. And it's still working on the details of that. There's several competing models out there trying to find the right way of doing it. And it's a, a very uh, difficult surgery, so that's going to be something that an orthopedic specialist is going to do. But in some cases where you have a very bad elbow, it's maybe the only option left. Mm. For hip dysplasia, we've got uh, multiple surgical options for that as well. And again, it depends on the age of the dog. When we diagnose them in two to three months of age, we can do a procedure called a pubic, pubic symphysitis. I'm not oh. saying that right. JPS is the okay. initials for that. <laughs> And what that does is we go in and there's a growth plate between the, in the, in the pubic bone um, that allows the, the hip to kind of grow at the same pace as everything else. If you fuse that early, it causes the acetabulum or the cup parts of the joints then to start twisting over the, the femoral head. Huh. 
So it basically distorts the growth of the pelvis so that instead of growing just normally larger, that part of it doesn't is not allowed to grow and you get better acetabular coverage and you eliminate the luxation that occurs because of the hip dysplasia. You have to catch them early. You go in there with uh, electrocautery and you just kill those cells, those grow growth plate cells between the, the two parts wow. of the pubic symphysis. And when, when you do that early enough, that can basically correct the problem uh, oh. with the lack of acetabular coverage. Okay. If you miss, if they're over four months of age, you're, that's pretty much not an option anymore. No. Um, between four months and a year of age, we could do the triple pelvic osteotomy, which basically does the same thing that the pubic synthesis was going to do, but it does it on dogs that are a little bit older, okay. a little bit bigger. Okay. And that's where we actually cut the, the bone in two or three places, depending on the surgeon's preference, and put in a special plate that then twists that acetabulum and rotates it okay. so that it gives better coverage of the femoral head to prevent that luxation of the joint or the joint popping out of the socket. Okay. That, again, that's done by a... a orthopedic surgeon. Once you get past a year of age, your surgical options are more limited. There's the total hip replacement, which can get very expensive, about four to $6,000, depending on where you go. Uh, it's removing that bad joint mm -hmm. and basically putting in a really good artificial joint. There are some potential complications with that, infections. Um, sometimes the joint doesn't stay locked in and it'll pop out and the dog may have a luxation of the artificial hip. Mm. But it's, when, they, when it goes well, they can have a really pretty good life with that. Yeah. So if it's a young dog and you've got health insurance, it might be something you're going to look at. Yeah. The other procedure we'll do if people can't afford that is the um, femoral head and neck osteectomy. And that's where we just remove the femoral head and neck. Mm -hmm. And that forms what's called a pseudoarthrosis or a false joint. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not normal for the dog, but it's pain-free. They don't have that pain of the bone grinding on bone anymore. Right. It basically gives them a chance to start using that leg and they'll have a little bit different gait because of it but they won't have the pain associated with it. It does have a failure rate just like anything else. Some dogs will have that surgery and they'll still won't use a leg. Yeah. So anytime we're having we're considering surgery we have to make sure we've considered every other option available. There are some uh, more conservative management treatments. In fact one of the statistics I was reading is that 70 to 75 percent of dogs with hip dysplasia most people don't even know they have hip dysplasia until later in life or they start having really severe problems. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. take much to manage those dogs. We've had a lot of luck using the glucosamine chondroitin yeah. supplements. The Dasquin is the one we recommend a lot, but there's a lot of good ones out there. And we talked about the joint supplements a few uh, couple months ago, and there are some really junky ones out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the ones you're going to buy over the counter online are not good supplements. Don't buy those. Ask your vet what glucosamine chondroitin supplement you should be using if you're going to do that. The other product that's uh, the, what's called the osteoarthritis modifying agent is the adequate. That's the injectable. Yeah. And we talked about that yeah. a little bit as well. And that basically, both those products are going to help prevent further degeneration in the joint, uh, protects the cartilage from um, deteriorating. And with the glucosamine chondroitins, it actually helps replace joint fluid and helps them regrow new cartilage. So hmm. they're very good products to get at the source of the pain for the animals. In terms of treating the pain, managing the pain, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, yes. the carprofens, meloxicam, um, there's a, probably three or four others out there that a lot of veterinarians use. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they mentioned and that I've seen as well is if the first drug doesn't work, try another one. Because even though they're all basically working the same way, some dogs respond better Probably. to one drug yeah. than another. So if your dog doesn't do well on carprofen, try Meloxicam. If they're mm. not doing well on Meloxicam, try the Deramax. Yeah, makes sense. Um, the most expensive one is the Galaprant, and that seems to work well for some dogs too. So yeah. there's a lot of options out there. Don't give your dog your leave, your ibuprofen, no. your aspirin, your mm -hmm. Tylenol, uh, without checking with your vet first and without trying other things because there can be a lot of potential side effects with mm -hmm. those. And with those medications, like we talked before, there's going to be monitoring of the blood work yeah. for these animals because a small percentage of it will affect their liver and kidneys and cause problems in the future. Fish oil is another great supplement for the joints. Mm -hmm. uh, it not only uh, helps with the joints, helps with their skin, a lot of other problems mm -hmm. that they can have. It makes the, the non steroidal anti-inflammatories more effective. So it's a good supplement to add in there. Uh, you know, your average 60 to 80 pound dog is going to take one human fish oil capsule a day. Um, I'm less picky about those. I think there's a lot of good supplements out there. It's going to be 
a uh, little bit harder to find uh, really bad ones out Fishery, there. So yeah. if, if you've got one that you're taking, great. Otherwise, ask your vet. They're usually going to stock something that's going to be good for them. Ideally, the best way to deal with hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia, because it's genetic, is to just get rid of the dogs that are carrying these genes. So good screening of the, the pets before you breed them, or if you have a pair and they produce a litter that has elbow or hip dysplasia, don't breed those animals again. That's a nicer way of putting it. <laughs> you say get rid of them. <laughs> Just well, don't breed them. <laughs> we, we, we won't get them out of the breeding population is go. what I want to say. Uh, there's a, the pen hip is a great screening tool if you want to check these younger animals out if you're looking for the hip dysplasia. Again, the elbow dysplasia, you can often find these in, in the dogs before they're six months of age. You're mm-hmm. going to see the changes there, and you're going to see the clinical symptoms. So be working with that. With hip dysplasia, we know that diet is very important. If you have a dog that is genetically predisposed to hip dysplasia, you can decrease the chance of them ex- um, showing those symptoms with the large breed puppy foods. Okay. And the thing that makes these large breed puppy foods special is they're restricted in the calcium per calories. What they were finding is that if they uh, were feeding them the same amount of calcium that the little dogs were getting per calorie, that's where the dogs were getting hip dysplasia. They restricted it was going away. Oh, okay. And it used to be back when I was a young vet, uh, <laughs> people would give these dogs uh, calcium phosphorus supplements because they thought it's a bone problem, let's give them something to help with the bones. And that was actually probably making the problem worse. Wow. Yeah. And then um, activity is important, making sure your dog's uh, activity is correct for their problem. Mm-hmm. If they've got bad elbows, maybe don't have them going down a lot of stairs. Maybe ha- have them a ramp or something so yeah. it's easier for them to get into things. Having stairs for them to get up and down off of beds and sofas that they like to get on. Those are all things that are just going to make their life a lot easier. And then following up with your veterinarians and doing regular checkups and adjusting the medication. There's lots of alternative therapies that we've been uh, working with as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The platelet rich plasma is a new, relatively new procedure where we take their own blood, separate out a part of it that has a lot of platelets in it and the fluid, and inject that into the joints. And that Mm -hmm. can actually help reduce the inflammation and pain in the joint for months. Mm -hmm. Three to six months is a typical um, treatment with that. Stem cell therapy is a great therapy for dogs with chronic hip or elbow problems. And that's where we take... And the lab that we use uses fat. There's other procedures where they use um, bone marrow cells to get the stem cells. And they'll process them and we'll inject those into the joints. And those can last for years yeah. from a single treatment. In fact, a lot of companies are now harvesting stem cells from young animals when they get spayed and neutered. And then using Save those in the future if they develop problems so that they, don't, they have the nice young healthy stem cells instead yeah. of the older stem cells that might be getting a little tired. So those are the things that were, and then laser therapy is another yes. option that we'll sometimes do. Uh, it's a more chronic treatment, but it's not invasive. Mm-hmm. It helps stimulate the anti-inflammatory tissues in the in the joints so that you're, you're getting less pain for the animals. They can move around better. You do a lot of laser treatments. You yes. see a lot of improvement oftentimes after the first treatment. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of owners that said some of the senior pets who start using the laser, you know, after the first treatment, sometimes it takes a few of them, but they start feeling much better. Um, sometimes our biggest complaint is that the pet feels so good that they go home, start running around, and then they re-aggravate an injury. Right. Um, so that's usually the hardest part because we have to tell the owner they're still technically injured mm-hmm. just because they feel better. Yeah. Don't let them, you know, over aggravate themselves. And uh, with hip problems, I oftentimes see that going down to knee problems. I see a mm-hmm. lot of dogs that have cruciate injuries also have hip dysplasia. Mm-hmm. So those are things to keep in mind as well. I think the joint supplements are really good uh, to help prevent that from going on later yeah. in life. And keep their weight down. I mean, don't they may be moving around less, so feed them less just so mm-hmm. they're not gaining that weight. And that's going to... Weight management is half the battle when dealing with joint pain. If you can get the weight down to a a decent level, you need a lot less pain medication for Mm -hmm. them going forward. All right, that pretty much wraps up our talk on elbow and hip dysplasia. Sorry, we had to break up into two parts. There's just a lot of things to go on (laughs) with that. But it's a very common thing we're still seeing. And maybe someday they'll have genetic tests where they'll be able to just, hey, let's do a a gene gene test on these dogs. All right, we're not breeding these. And we'll be able to go from there and we'll be able to get rid of it. And I think that's probably closer than we think, but if we hear news of that, we're going to certainly pass that along. Yep. All right, let's move on to pet health news. And this has something to do last Sunday this was Sunday. Super Bowl. Yep. Did it, did it, did If anyone who saw it, they probably saw the really, really cute WeatherTech commercial. Right. Um, so the CEO 
um, founder of WeatherTech, uh, McNeil, he actually spent six million dollars uh, to get a commercial onto that Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so the commercial, you know, was for the University of Wisconsin Veterinary Me uh, Medicine, and it was for you know as pretty much a thank you uh, for the school of treating his golden retriever, retriever for an aggressive form of cancer. Yes, it was like a, a heart-based tumor, mm -hmm. angiosarcoma. Yep, yeah. um, this, pu uh, I can't say pup because he is a senior, but this golden um, had a grim 1% chance for survival at wow. this. Wow, yeah, 1% yeah, chance that these dogs are going to make it through mm -hmm. treatment. Yeah, um, so last summer, uh, David McNeil and his family were heartbroken to learn that the tumor was in their dog Scout's heart. Um, and the retriever had only about a month to live. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, Scout only had 1% chance of beating this by himself at all, right. or even with the help. Um, McNeil um, let out a statement saying that, you know, when he was in the room after having gotten a diagnosis, um, his dog was sitting there in the corner wagging his tail looking at him. And, you know, he told himself, I'm not putting this dog down. Right. There was just absolutely no way. Um, so he traveled to, you know, uh, the Wisconsin Veterinary Center where the mm -hmm. scout retrieved chemotherapy, uh, radiation therapy, immunotherapy. And by September, you know, poor Golden, he's only seven. By uh, September, his tumor had gone down to about 90%. Like it had decreased that small. Wow. Um, That's amazing. So today, the tumor is all but disappeared, the school reported. So he's doing fabulous. He's that 1%. He's that 1%. Well, it helps if you have a multi-million dollar company. It, it does. Yeah. And then we were also reading Scout. He is the golden in the commercials. Right. So if you've ever seen the WeatherTech commercial, I always thought it was just a random golden. Yeah. This is the CEO of Miller's dog. So he's also, I think, and making this royalties too. This is a local too. company. They're just like down the road. Yeah, they're like Brook. in Brolingbrook. Yeah. Um, so McNeil released a statement that they wanted this Super Bowl effort to not only raise awareness, but to um, also help with financial support for the incredible research that's going on at the school. And yeah. then for a scout, because he is still a patient there. Right. Um, so, you know, even though the tumor has gone down, he is still getting treated. So just think, instead of giving the school the $6 million, he bought them much more of that in publicity. Mm -hmm. so well, because he's also there. hoping um, that with a raising uh, a raising this awareness right. um, that it can help the school with you know the medication and then buy more um, materials and things like that to help with the research and you know purchase of equipment to help right. identify new cancers and fighting treatments and things like this um, but Scout meanwhile he's happily back to you know being an unofficial mascot you know doing his duties he's gonna be in some more commercials um, and he's just spending time with his best friend McN Mr. McNeil yeah and you think there's there's not that many people who could afford to do the treatment and no. I'm sure it was probably tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand dollars, to treat this dog's mm -hmm. tumor. Well, and then I was also telling one of my coworkers, um, you know, if he only wanted to spend fifty thousand, he could have gone to. Uh, there's a school where they <laughs> cloned the dog before. Right. A lady spent fifty thousand each time to clone her dog three times. Wow! And it was successful, and all four dogs now <laughs> are doing great. <laughs> you know, I actually saw at the conference there was a company that was. Advertising their clothing services. Yeah. So they are starting out Sorry. there. They're doing it. It's happening. Right. But the other thing is, once they've treated this dog, now those oncologists have had a chance to see what therapies are working. So mm -hmm. the next one that comes in, they can say, hey, we've done this. We've gotten a great success with this therapy. And they're going to learn a lot. So thanks to the McNeil family for, for everything they did supporting the, the vet school. Yeah. Um, putting that ad out. Yeah. Raising the awareness. That's just a wonderful thing that mm -hmm. they did. So it's just, you know, all these Super Bowl ads can be a lot silly, <laughs> but sometimes there's some really powerful stories behind yeah. them. And this is the one that I thought would be a good one to share with our, mm -hmm. our listening audience. All right, I've got something I want to talk about, and this is from um, the American Humane Society. Oh. And they are doing, I think it's their seventh annual Hero Veterinarian and Hero Veterinary Nurse Awards. Oh. A sponsor with Zoetis, which is one of the companies that does a lot of the medications and drugs and vaccines. So pet owners and animal lovers are invited to visit the HeroVetAwards.org website before April 2nd to nominate veterinarians and veterinary nurses who are dedicated to improving the lives of animals and promoting the human-animal bond. Okay. The winning veterinarian and veterinary nurse will travel to Los Angeles to be honored as part of the 10th Annual American Humane Hero Dog Awards, GALA, in September, which will air on the Hallmark Channel this fall. 
about it. So there's going to be five finalists selected in each category, vets and veterinary nurses. And beginning uh, June 11th, the public will be invited to vote online for their favorite veterinarian and veterinary nurse. Aww. So the American Humane Society Vet uh, Hero Veterinarian and Hero Veterinary Nurse Awards are their way of thanking these tireless individuals, said Tara Big Bid good, uh, a <laughs> veterinarian who's the executive director of the Zoetis Pet Care Veterinary Professional Services. Uh, veterinarians and veterinary nurse, nurses are leading the effort to keep America's animals happy and healthy, and they deserve recognition. Oh, nice. So the nomination period is open now between January 23rd and April 2nd. So if you know a veterinarian that you think should be nominated, hint, hint. <laughs> Um, go ahead to the website and do that. They're going to open up the voting from June 11th to August 13th, so we'll okay. let people know when that comes up again and so that they uh, know to go and vote for that. Yep. And then the Hero Dog Awards Gala will be September 26th. Cool. So, again, if you want to go and nominate somebody, the website is HeroVetAwards, all one word, dot org. Okay. HeroVetAwards.org. So thanks to the American Community State and Zoetis for doing for recognizing yeah. the people who are working really hard. All right, we've got an update on one of our case of the week. Yeah. So we talked a while ago about Margot, uh, the little uh, spaniel who had the heart defect. Mm -hmm. She had this um, pulmonary stenosis. And these owners, kind of like the McNeil family, yes. decided, you know, this dog is too valuable to us. We're going to do everything we can. And they took her to have a procedure done, mm -hmm. uh, a valvuloplasty, a balloon plasty, where they widened the, the part of the, the valve and the, the vessel that was narrowed. Right. And so she's going to be on lifelong medication to keep her heart rate low, but she just came in for her, um, her pro-heart. Her pro-heart injection, Yeah, yes. so that's her heartworm preventative, so obviously we don't want her to get heartworm disease. But it's kind of nice to see um, Margot still doing well, mm -hmm. still responding, acting like a normal puppy, growing, oh, yeah. putting on weight, everything she should be doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of dogs, if they don't have this treatment condition by this time, they're in really serious condition. Yeah. So that was a really successful outcome for her. Yeah, the whole clinic was surprised when... We came in the back in this little Margo. We were like, oh, she's here, and it's a pro heart injection. This is great. Yeah. Because the last couple of times we saw her, it was not for something that simple. Right. Um, but she's happy. She's healthy. Um, of course, she's a little nervous because of, you know, all, everything she's had been through in her short puppyhood and mm -hmm. clinics. But otherwise, she's doing great. Yeah. Um, I'm happy for the owner, and I'm happy for Margo. Okay. Uh, so that's our update on the case of yeah. the week. We're going to move on to tech tips. Yes. And now last week we you talked about adopting senior dogs. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a client call me the other day. She adopted an older cat. It was, you know, inherited basically. And it's got some kidney issues and stuff was was her concerns. But I'm sure you've we've probably seen a lot of people that come in adopting yes. senior cats. So if we're going to talk about adopting senior dogs, talk let's, about let's the kitty cats. Uh, yes. update people on what they should be expecting when they're adopting a yes. senior cat. So Cats are fun to adopt anyway. You know, they have their own personality. It's like taking in another person in your house. Right. Um, usually most people, they come in with kittens and they're prepared for the long run of, you know, at least eight to ten years of maybe happy, healthy kitten. Um, most people who adopt senior pets, and that's, you know, maybe eight or older, um, you know, when they're adopting them, they have to look into, you know, potential medical issues. Um, by this time, most cats are set in their ways. Um, so when you have an older cat, you, you know, you can't really train them to your schedule. This cat is coming in with the personality all their own and they're coming in with what they want. Yes. Um, that's usually what most people like, especially if you like a cat with a lot of personality. Yeah. But a lot of things you have to look into, um, you know, feeding restrictions. Um, a lot of cats, especially if you adopt like an older senior cat, if they have hairballs, you know, hairball control, kidney failure, mm -hmm. things like yeah, that. Heart disease. Heart disease thyroid, um, disease. thyroid disease. A lot of these things, you know, can be helped with special diets. Whereas if you get a kitten, you just put it on kitten formula. Right. But if, when you get a doctor, a senior cat, you have to, you know, look into, you know, how much protein how much fat you know if you get a special diet you yeah. know you're going to be seeing the vet a lot more often diabetic especially. diets are another big thing that older mm -hmm. cats will have to deal with yeah or if you have to give them fluids if they have kidney issues yes. um a lot of you know a lot of people who do adopt senior pets you know adopt them because they don't want 
hyperactive crazy kittens so they're like you know we want right. a calmer cat um but that doesn't mean just because you adopt a senior pet that they're not gonna be you know hyperactive sometimes um they do tend to still get their zoomies which is good they're happy and they like to explore mm -hmm. and hide out that means they're comfortable windows. in your house they you know they've claimed it all their own good. um but most people you know they think they get a senior pet and they just sit in the house and sleep or hide and that's normal that's not completely normal for all cats. Usually that could be that there's something underlining going right. on. Um, and, you know, maybe a day or two or even a week for the cat to get adjusted to the household. Hiding can be normal. And, you know, maybe skipping a meal here and there can be normal. But, if you know, that a newly adopted senior cat continues to do that, that's usually a sign that you need to get your cat to the clinic. Um, you know, there may be something going on that they didn't show when they were at the adoption facility or sometimes even stress can bring on underlying diseases yeah. that, you know, they didn't have when they were at that adoption facility. Um, so these are just things that you have to be mindful of when, again, adopting a senior pet. Um, it's, it's always fun to do that because, again, they come in with their own right. personalities. Right. Um, but again, it's just, it is a big thought. It's just like getting a puppy or a kitten. When you're adopting seniors, you have to be prepared for the long run. Even if that long run is only a few years, you have to be prepared for the steps that yes. come with a senior. So medications, if you can give a pet medications or not. Right. Um, if you, uh, cats, if they have kidney issues, if you can give it fluids. Right. Um, if they're going to be on diabetic uh, insulin injections or thyroid mm -hmm. medication, you have to be committed to giving that medication twice a day. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to, you know, be prepared for your hours too. If you're going to take in a senior pet, mm -hmm. you know, be prepared to have those hours to sit there in comfort with them. A lot of senior pets do have anxiety issues from being in shelters. And a lot of times um, anxiety issues do get better when sitting with the owner yeah um so if you get a cat because you're at home for four hours a day and those four hours you want company but then the other hours you're gone if that cat has you know already anxiety issues be prepared to probably come home to finding a present in the bed or in your shoes or something like that and then don't get mad at them and take them back you know you've adopted a senior pet who probably already had that anxiety issue um but it's one of those things that your life you know, just expand it further and you have to be prepared right. to have something else in it. And, you know, it's not just you anymore. You adopted a senior pet. Right. You got to be ready to take care of them. I just think it's wonderful when people will go in and say, you know, I don't necessarily need a kitten. Give mm -hmm. me one of these cats that has been here for a while. Yeah. And it needs a good home. Well, we have one lady who did that. She went to a shelter. She honestly didn't look at any of the animals. She just went up to the desk and she said, what cat has been here the longest? She went up and found one of the cats that had been there for five years. Wow. Yes. The cat was sitting there for five years, and it's because I, I, the cat isn't the prettiest. <laughs> so I can see how if someone walks past, they're like, er, scruffy-looking cat. Um, wow. But he had been there for five years, and he is literally the sweetest cat. She brought him in. We did blood work, everything. His blood work's beautiful. He's, I think, like 12 or 13 now. So, you know, senior cat considering blood work is beautiful that's great too yeah he's the scruffiest little thing <laughs> <laughs> like i think it's one of those i i think he's cute because i like his story um but he's got a home now and that's that's good because you know for 13 year old cat been sitting there for five years waiting for a home you know most of the time pe when people adopt senior animals which i love them for this they want these animals to have their last couple of years to be nice comfortable couple of years you don't want to be stressful sitting in a cage you know and those are your final thoughts really right. and so you know i i love this owner who did it and again the owner you know that i spoke about last week who adopted the old shepherd i love those guys right. for it and i love people who you know take the time to adopt a senior yeah. pet in general and i would it's just great. recommend people even if they're all up to the end their shots and everything take them into your vet get mm -hmm. a good checkup done um it's hard when they're in a kennel or a situation like that to know if they've got arthritis because they're not moving around a lot anyway. So mm -hmm. it's nice to know those things. And yeah, having a blood panel done to, to evaluate everything and see how it's yeah. going. Yeah. Because okay. again, you never know what underlying disease they'll get from coming home. Yeah. Yeah. And what the stress can do. Yep. All right. That's it for this week. Yep. 
Next week, we're going to be going into congestive heart failure in dogs. Okay. So that's something we do see fairly common. Oh, yes. uh, it's a, a common disease. Heart disease in dogs and cats a little bit different in uh, the causes and the, and the ways that we manage them in some cases. So we're going to probably go into the cats at a later time. But I think dogs we see enough of, I think that's going to be a really important one. So we'll talk about the causes of it, the treatments, and the prognosis that you have going forward. Yep. So as remember, uh, always remember to subscribe yep. and follow us. And uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, apparently there's a little bell you need to click to get notifications. Oh, there's a bell. Yeah, so you oh. click the, the subscribe, and then if you click the bell, you'll get notifications when the new episodes are up. Oh, okay. So if you're new to YouTube and you're just watching us there, make sure you do that. Just if you're on your favorite podcast, make sure to follow us uh, on the podcast, and then you'll get the notifications that way. And we'll see you next time on The yep. Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. Bye.